Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and welcome everyone to, uh, to our tonight's program. Um, you're joining us uh, at the Mid-Atlantic Renewable Energy Association, the Morea.org, where you can find us on our website. And I'd like to welcome, welcome you to tonight's presentation. Before we begin, I would like to let you know about upcoming events. Uh, Thursday, March 11th at 6.30 p.m., which is in two weeks, our next book discussion features David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet, which is both a book and also a beautiful feature film available on Netflix. Sir David Attenborough, who fascinated us with the wonders of nature through life on Earth, the living planet, the blue planet, and many others, shares some of his life experiences and the perspective he has gained through his extraordinary adventures and his views on our planet's prospects and its opportunities. It's a fascinating, fast read or beautiful film to take in. So to, either way, uh, it's, it's a, a wonderful experience. So uh, then come listen to others and share your views on how you have seen the planet's change, the planet change and which ideas uh, that we should pursue. So that's a, a book discussion. It's not a presentation, but a discussion. Uh, and uh, people have found it very enjoyable. The next uh, event is Tuesday, March 30th at 7 p.m. Uh, our next monthly presentation, uh, we learned from air products expert, Allison Hawkins, about the greening of hydrogen, another controversial energy storage medium that is undergoing behind the scenes transformations and shows promise in greening our transportation emissions. Then on Tuesday, April 27th, uh, the following month at 7 p.m., always on the last Tuesday of the month, we get to see up close how to becoming more accessible, but it's a lot more than just plugging in a set of batteries. This presentation will really help you get a better picture of home energy generation and distribution and where we hope to be headed. And now to introduce tonight's program. Wood has been a burning controversy in environmental circles since the 1990s when it was credited as, credited as a renewable fuel. One result is that we are chopping down our forests in the south and using energy to press them into pellets and ship them to Europe where they don't have any, enough trees so they can burn them and get credit for it as renewable energy. Yet there has always been the connection to the campfire, the fireplace, the wood stove, that makes it natural, a benign taking against more industrial sources. In preparing for tonight's presentation, I was pleased to hear that there are ways to burn wood that offer a better trade-off to other fuels, that it really can be more sustainable. The key is the preparation of the wood, the equipment that is used and how the burning is managed. Tonight, we have two highly knowledgeable fire builders to share how you can build a better fire. John Ackerley, founder and president of Alliance for Green Heat, a nonprofit that promotes cleaner, more efficient, and more affordable renewable heating, will help us understand the issues and opportunities for building a better home fire. We don't typically associate home wood burning with efficiency or emissions, but there are vast differences between fireplaces and an efficient wood burning stove. The equipment is important, but so is the fuel and the operator. All three can make the difference between a serious assault to the environment and a sustainable way to heat your home. John will guide you through just what it takes to build a better fire. But first, Jay Clark, vice president and one of the founding partners of AFS Energy Systems, a leading supplier of industrial renewable biomass systems, will share his extensive experience with industrial wood burning processes. What types of biomaterials are used and which ones work best from a value, efficiency, and environmental perspective? He will share the importance of considering the complete system, including preparing the feedstocks for combustion, controlling emissions, and handling and disposition of the remaining ash. He will differentiate, differentiate good from bad wood burning applications and share industry improvements that have made wood burning better. So now I'm pleased to introduce Jay Clark. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, my name is Jay Clark. I'm with AFS Energy Systems. Um, I'm from Florida. I moved up here 40 years ago, gosh, 45 years ago. And um, we've been involved in the biomass combustion system business 
ever since then. Uh, me and my partners worked for another company prior to starting AFS Energy Systems. Um, and we're still in business. I mean, burning wood is not new or burning biomass is not new. And there's a lot of different biomasses that we do. Burn. That will help you see what some of the other, what they look like um, coming up with the next slide. But there's all kind of biomass fuels. Um, and I, I list these just to show all the different fuels that we have available to burn. Uh, planar shavings, which is, believe it or not, a fluffy fuel and not that easy to burn. Uh, whole tree chips, sawmill chips, bark, softwood sawmill chips, um, hogged waste, and you've even been, uh, burned spit grains from Alaska Brewing in Juneau, Alaska. So there's all different types of biomass fuels. This, this slide here, <laughs> every time I see, on the left is what the customer ordered on the right is what the customer got. And that's always a problem when you're buying from people that aren't dependable in as far as your fuel supply is concerned. But I've seen that a lot. I mean, there, your supplier at some point is going to try to sneak something into you that really is not that useful as far as the fuel is concerned. There's all types of material handling equipment. Uh, mechanical, we use pneumatic. Um, and there's no need going into all the individual things because we're going to cover a lot of that stuff here in the next few slides. This is some of the mechanical transfer systems, which are conveyors. Um, I mean, we're not going to get into a lot of detail here. What I really want you to understand is that the biggest portion of your system in industrial applications like we're going through here, John's going to talk about homes, but uh, is all different types of material transfer systems, all different types of transfer systems like pneumatic and mechanical. There's material receiving and transfer systems that in, in one particular case, I have a customer, it's a university that actually backs the truck into the item on the left and actually discharges an entire 48,000 or 48 foot truckload into that, into that bin and then pulls out and leaves it for us to eventually get it up into the storage silos. That's another shot from that. I've got one customer in Pennsylvania that basically just uses a trailer is for their material receiving or the material storage and transfer system. So here's the different types of fuel storage systems. Um, we'll get to all these individually. So I'm just giving you a list right now, and then we'll move on to some of the pictures and a little more description. Uh, the fuel bunker is one of the most prominent um, receiving and storage systems that we that we work on for customers that don't produce their own fuel. Uh, at the on the extreme right, you can see what the material receiving building looks like. What you don't see is that just below all that material that you see creeping up there is the, the, the bunker floor. And it's about eight or 10, maybe even a grade. So a trailer can come in, they can dump, they can leave. They can do it in no time at all. This is a, one of our clients that has to purchase a majority of their fuel. Um, here's another type of bunker system that I really don't need to get into a lot of description for, but there is a, a different type of bunker system. 
Uh, and then there's storage silos. Typically, you'll see storage silos. And all they do is, in many cases, just blow it right into the top of that silo. And that silo could hold, you know, three, four, five days worth of storage. And that's what the unloaders look like. Basically, the unloaders actually bring the fuel into a center point, it discharges, and subsequently it and then is transferred to the boiler system. There's a walking floor type storage system, in which case that the customer actually loads that with a big front end unloader. That's a the Army base in uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia there. Um, one of the other pieces of equipment that we use a lot, or I shouldn't say we use a lot. Most people think that there's no metal in their fuel, but let me tell you what there is. So we've got magnets, like the one on the far left. We've got a suspended magnet, like the one in the middle and the suspended magnet that has materials on it that you can see on the far right. So there is going to be metal in the fuel. Sawmills break tooths. They have bolts and nuts um, that drop down into their, into their material transfer system. There's going to be metal in the fuel. And in many cases, it's going to pass out with no problem whatsoever. But in a lot of cases, it could cause some problems. So metal doesn't burn. We get, should get rid of it if we can. And I'm going to remind you that we're really talking about, you know, pretty big applications for wood-fired boilers now. We're talking about big systems that are need to be dependable, and they need to be running 24 hours a day, and they need to be running 350 or 360 days a year. Um, oversized products, um, when, when we get stuff like whole tree chips, which is no more than roadside clearing waste or clearing for uh, new buildings or whatever the case may be, there's going to be oversized material, even if they've ground it before they bring it to it. That just shows a couple different type of screening systems. And there's another one. That's... That's actually a scroll, sawmill screener that we used on this particular application here, where the stuff they were buying was roadside waste. This goes back probably 20 years, and some of the oversized stuff were tree limbs. We're getting, they're getting a lot better product now, but that is screening out the overs. It's going directly into a hogger here. And when I say hogger, that's a big uh, 200 horsepower, in this case, uh, grinder that grinds up the material, puts it back into the storage system. And all the accepts are going directly to storage in this particular case. Emission controls. This is what the old emission controls looked like. Two mechanical, flash collectors that just basically separated the material. Um, the ash dropped down into these barrels. These barrels were manually hauled out of the boiler room. And in many cases, they went to the farmer. In many cases, they were just piled up outside. Mission controls today are completely different. Uh, a bag house is no more than a huge vacuum cleaner. So the dirty gas is going here and we're sucking through a bunch of bags that are hanging down in this area right here. The clean air is going out the stack. I mean, no particulate hardly whatsoever with this type of cleaning device. And then there's the electrostatic precipitator that we're finding on most of our jobs where we actually charge the particles coming in, they stick to a negative plate, and then that plate is cleaned with hammers um, that actually bang it every now and then, and they drop down into hoppers that's 
discharged out. This, this is the type of uh, particular emission equipment that's required today, mostly. Ash handlings can be a big deal depending on the amount of ash that's in the fuel that we're burning. But here's our mechanical collectors again. Years ago, we just dropped it down into drums that was discharged, that was dumped by the client. Uh, in many cases, ash handling's a big deal. It depends on the amount of ash that's in the fuel. But here's a customer that actually has two big roll offs that has so much ash and it's such a big system that we're actually loading these roll offs and dumping them on a, I think, a monthly basis, both of them. The different type of stokers, um, you know, there's no system that, you know, if you if you remember all the different types of fuels we had, there's no fuel, there's no stoker systems that's going to work in every case. There's the pneumatic stoker, where we're basically just blowing the material into the furnace. This would be good for any of the fuels that are free flowing. We actually have uh, underfed stokers and we have an overfed stoker. And this is the one we use mostly for the uh, high ash type fuels because ultimately, and I'm gonna show you a couple more slides that show that. Oh, I forgot this one. Uh, we have the overfed ram. And believe it or not, um, in Germany, and this is a, a copy of a slide that one of my partners took over in Germany, they actually load their boiler systems or combustion systems over there, even with cordwood. So this is a big hydraulic lamp ram that whatever you put into the metering bin is going to be pushed into the furnace and it's going to burn. Ash removal. Mechanical, in this case, you have to open up those fire doors and you have to scrape the ash out of the furnace. You, you turn off the induced draft fan or the combustion air fans for just a few seconds. You open those doors, you scrape the ash out and you're back in operation. Um, that's basically for your low ash fuels. And here again is a is a copy of the ash removal with the automatic ash removal. Basically, we enter the fuel at the top here. By the time it gets down to the lowest point, which you can see in the little circle over there to the left, it's going to be ash, and we automatically remove it from the furnace. So it doesn't start melting any of the uh, contaminated fuel in there like the ash or the or the sand or dirt or any of that sort of stuff. And there's another shot of it showing you the input over to the far right and the discharge over to the far left. There's another shot of the grates that have automatic ash removal. Every one of those grates move and index the fuel down to the discharge point. So we can time it to the point that when we get to the bottom, it's nothing but ash. And I can't spend much time on these slides because they're too busy, but it just gives you a good idea of how much of your boiler system in an industrial application is gonna be the actual boiler system or a lot of the material receiving preparation, screening, grinding, and all the storage and stuff over to the, the far left there. And another system that shows you how. I mean, in many cases, the, the cost of the material receiving storage system will be equal to, or in some cases, even more than the actual steam boiler system or boiler system. Just another 3D of that, of a, one of our jobs. And we started out in the forest products industry where people didn't really 
care about what their boiler rooms look like, but in the last 15 years, our clients do. This is a university. This is uh, a school. Um, the center two are the state government up in Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, the one on the top right, on the right is uh, um, Millipore Sigma, which is a, um, a company up in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, and then a, a, a college in Bennington, Vermont, just below that. You can see the different companies that we've sold to, uh, three hospitals so far. And hospitals are great because they have a summer and winter load. So um, customer schools and universities, ESCOs, um, your, your energy services company, and most of our past customers have been forest products related, which I have listed a few there. But in an apartment of corrections, a cheese plant, <laughs> I mean, everybody is burning wood. And the funny thing about it is that we're talking about this is new. And I've had customers that have been burning wood for over 200 years or even more now. I've got to remember how old I am. So at that point, um, I'll uh, turn it over to whoever wants to take the next reins. Thank you, Jay. Um, are you all set? Uh, if you could unshare your screen, Jay. Uh, stop share. Very good. All right. Now, uh, John, go ahead. Can you share your screen? Okay. <clears throat> you see it there? Not yet. No? Oh. Um, <coughs> let's see. I see you. Okay. Now, do you see it? Yep. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks very much for inviting me to do this. Um, and I look forward to some of your other uh, presentations that you mentioned in the beginning. So um, I'm the head of a, a group that uh, comes to this from more of an environmental point of view. I was very motivated to get involved with this as a way to reduce fossil fuels. And um, I've been doing it now uh, 10 or 11 years. <clears throat> and I just looked through some of the people on this uh, presentation and some of you have been doing this for 30 or 40. So um, it's one thing I love about this is there's always more to learn. And there's a lot of people who are to learn from in this uh, <clears throat> community. OK, so I'm going to start with fire basics about how to build a clean fire. But then I'm going to get into more policy issues that also have to do with um, uh, clean burning. So fire basics, as everyone knows, you need oxygen, heat, and fuel. <clears throat> um, but you know, when you're not dealing with a system like Jay just showed, these huge systems that are very automated, uh, getting the right mix of these things in a little uh, steel or box in your living room is actually pretty complicated. And the reason is that uh, it's not automated. So <clears throat> all the oxygen, the heat, and the fuel are all controlled to some extent by the operator. And uh, it's not automated, and we really look forward to more automation in uh, the wood stove community. Okay, so after, the, after this, you need what we call the three Ts. You need time, temperature, and turbulence. And this brings us into some of the new technology. Uh, in order to get a stove certified by the EPA, you need all to focus on all this stuff, time, temperature, and turbulence. On the left hand, you see the um, fire bricks. You can't really certify a stove without fire bricks because that retains enough heat in the stove to get 
clean combustion. Otherwise your stove would be uh, losing too much heat to the room too quickly. You also need turbulence. You see in the middle uh, image, the baffle that is in the top of the stove that forces the air to go around it and then before it goes up the chimney and that helps you create turbulence. And then you inject secondary air into the top of the chamber and that creates more turbulence. And it's amazing, you know, it's the goal is really just to keep that smoke in the chamber literally another second or two. Um, and that's enough to make a significant difference in uh, reburning that smoke. After all, you know, smoke is, most of smoke is unburned wood. So if you can reburn your smoke, you, there's a lot of BTUs in smoke. So that's the whole goal uh, of this game of clean combustion is reburning those BTUs before they escape out the chimney. Okay, so you know, we could spend a whole uh, thing talking about firewood. Firewood is really the, uh, probably the biggest problem of all in residential um, wood burning. Uh, seasoned firewood, you know, in Maryland, sometimes I've, I go out and look for it. It's almost impossible to find even in late fall. Um, and I'd say it could be half of Americans are using wood that's not sufficiently seasoned. So it involves procuring it early enough. And honestly, sometimes that means more than a year. Here in the East Coast, we have this wonderful you know, um, <clears throat> maples and all sorts of hardwoods. But some of them actually take more than a year. And the old timers know this old timers you know, up in New Hampshire, and uh, they will uh, have their, their wood stacked for you know a year or two in a row. <clears throat> The other big problem is having your pieces too big. You know, you really, to get good, clean combustion, your wood shouldn't be more than three to six inches in diameter. <clears throat> um, you see the, uh, the family in the upper right, a lot of that wood really should be cut in half again, assuming it's going into a wood stove and not into a more automated boiler. And of course, the other thing is keeping it stored. So you really need to have some sort of covered shed. And these are, uh, these, this is a design on the right that's uh, being promoted by the EPA, which does a lot of good work to help homeowners figure out how to burn cleaner. The image in the lower uh, left with snow covered, so that wood is not gonna dry because it's not split. There's virtually no point trying to get uh, wood uh, to dry very quickly. <clears throat> And then, so the biggest culprit you see on the bottom right uh, for outdoor wood boilers is the ability to load these massive logs in them. Uh, and the traditional outdoor wood boilers before they became certified, it's just impossible to get a log that big to uh, burn cleanly. So I'm gonna look, uh, talk a little bit more about technology. <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned, if the image in the middle this is a lot of stoves in the 70s and 80s after the energy crisis were extremely basic and they didn't have a baffle. They didn't have fire bricks. They didn't have secondary air being injected in them. So the, the smoke went right up. So you lost a huge amount of heat, but you also uh, put a lot of pollution into the air. So the image on the right, you see this is uh, an uncertified stove but it started to get some of the basics. You got the uh, primary air going into the bottom, secondary air going uh, up higher, and you had a baffle. So this is still, that's still a primitive stove. You, you really couldn't get that stove to uh, pass modern EPA certification standards. Now on the far left, that's Ben Franklin's stove. Actually what Ben Franklin designed wasn't even a stove, it was a fireplace because he did not put a door on it. Um, but he did understand that you needed to, to um, shed some more heat. Um, you, if you have a, a path for your smoke um, that can go down before it goes back up, you can capture more heat. Um, and so part of uh, my point is, you know, the, the technology doesn't always go in one direction. Uh, 
a lot of things that people learned in the 18 and 1900s were forgotten by the folks building wood stoves in the 70s and 80s. Um, okay, so now here's the modern certified stove. You can see uh, the image with all the numbers, the image on the top left. That's a, a pretty um, good version of what almost all stoves look like today. Virtually every stove, you have to have a lot of air tubes in the top. You have to have fire brick. Um, you, you, <clears throat> often you have uh, air to give a window wash to keep your window clean. And um, so the engine of the modern stove is really, it's pretty amazing that you can build something this sophisticated without electricity. Because the engine of a stove is the, the chimney. And as the chimney draws uh, smoke up because of the heat of the smoke, it enables the stove to suck air in and then uh, put it in different places in the firebox where it's needed. Now, um, and that's a non-cast stove. That is the most popular stove in America. Probably 80% uh, of stoves were non uh, were non-cast stoves. That may change in the future, but um, they're cheaper and more basic and easier to run. Below that, you'll see the catalytic stove, uh, or this one is actually a hybrid. It has secondary air in the top, but it also has a catalyst, which is a honeycomb chamber that will combust smoke as it passes through that chamber. When these things are uh, maintained and used well, they work well. If they're not maintained and used well, they can uh, work even worse than uh, a basic non-cat stove. And uh, in the lower right, you'll see a masonry stove. And this is actually an ancient uh, design. So this represents a very sophisticated uh, piece of technology that's existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't really tr uh, cross the Atlantic very well. So it remains popular in Europe, uh, but not here, in part because they are very expensive and very heavy. Okay, pellet stoves. So pellet stoves, we uh, think are real the, the sweet spot of residential uh, heating because uh, the pellets are very consistent and low moisture content, five to seven percent compared to wood, which should be 15 to 20, but a lot of folks are burning wood at 30 percent uh, moisture content or more. <clears throat> and it also can control the oxygen. Uh, you want oxygen of about 10 to 12 percent, and, and Jay will know much more about this. It's the exact same in, um, you know, in much larger systems. You need to control that oxygen so you don't have uh, too much or too little. Uh, and it's very difficult to do that in a wood stove, but uh, pellet stoves can do it a lot better. Um, the uh, one problem with the pellet, pellet stoves is the air wash. Every, you know, consumers want a, a clean uh, glass on the front of their stove. And so designers have to put air that uh, keeps that, washes over that front glass. But with a pellet stove, that can really reduce efficiency. So that's one of the challenges uh, for in the modern engineers is to keep your efficiency high while keeping the glass clean. Okay, the future of stoves. We, we've been um, very excited by the possibility of automating the stove. And what that means is you know, basically taking some of the uh, technology and concepts from the automobile where you have an oxygen sensor, a lambda sensor. And so you can control the amount of oxygen in the firebox second by second and get it uh, just right. You can increase your efficiency and you will, you can control the, your emissions far better than the average Joe homeowner can. This technology uh, is progressing faster in Europe. Um, and one of the biggest problems is that consumers don't want, most of them don't want a, a automated stove. Uh, they don't know, I mean, a lot of consumers aren't, the, the highest priority isn't cleanliness. Their highest priority is affordable heat. So um, it's a hard sell. So a lot of uh, designers or some of the companies making these 
don't even necessarily advertise that they're automated because it's not necessarily a selling point. Um, the image on the top is MFI or a company in uh, Maryland that, who does advertise this and, uh, and they are trying to convince people that automation um, is the way to go. And I think they <coughs> can really appeal to, you know, especially more younger, more um, environmentally conscious consumers. <laughs> Okay, so uh, finally, you know, for years we've been working to get uh, parity with solar. And as of uh, January 1st, there is a investment tax credit, 26% for wood stoves and pellet stoves and boilers that are 75% efficient or higher. Um, and we hope that this will help people to change out stoves and get rid of their old stoves um, and, uh, and it can be paired with state incentives as well. We uh, urge people to look at the EPA database for, uh, to determine the efficiency. Manufacturers will often exaggerate efficiency. Um, it's, it's been a huge problem in the past. And uh, what we really need now is for the IRS to issue guidance. And we know that they're working on it. And the IRS will almost certainly recognize the EPA database as the only way to determine efficiency. The, that database gets its data from uh, EPA approved labs, third party labs that test stoves under very exacting conditions. And um, what they do when you test a stove, you test it at all four burn rates, uh, low, high, and then medium, low, medium, high. And uh, you average those four. And you can see on the uh, lower right, that's actually for uh, pellet stoves often just have three settings for test purposes. And that shows where people often, uh, well, one group of people, where they burn their stoves at. So it shows 18% uh, well, they will burn it on high. Um, but the point is that each, each setting is a different efficiency. And the consumer does not know which is the highest and which is the lowest. The consumer is also just basing it on how much heat they get. And uh, the higher the heat does not mean the higher the efficiency. Um, usually the lowest heat uh, is not the highest efficiency. But the, um, the point is, uh, we really hope the IRS uh, does this soon so that both manufacturers and uh, consumers will have the same um, be working off the same page and know what to expect and know what to buy. Okay, uh, carbon. Now we're getting a little away from clean heating, but this is, you know, uh, with each passing year, we found there's a lot of uh, concern among environmentalists and really everyone about how much uh, carbon is being released from wood and how quickly it gets reabsorbed. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is that how the wood, uh, how wood procured really matters. Larger scale harvesting of whole trees is very different than how most homeowners get their wood. And most, a lot of homeowners will scavenge their wood or it's down trees from storms, or it's extremely um, local, low impact harvesting, uh, uh, selecting you know, trees from the forest. This has been done for hundreds of years. So we have you know, proof that over time, uh, residential heating actually has gotten more and more sustainable. Uh, 100, 200 years ago, it wasn't very sustainable because we were clearing land and uh, it was the only fuel we had. So there was serious problems. But uh, with each passing decade, fewer people are using wood for uh, primary heating. Um, I mean, more, it's generally going down. It goes up and down a little bit, depending on uh, uh, the year these days. And also efficiency really matters. If you are burning biomass to make electricity, you may be only getting about 30% efficiency. So you're wasting two thirds of the tree. When you use heat, you're getting off around 75% efficiency. So this really matters when you're doing your carbon calculations and you're trying to figure out you know, what the impact is and how long um, 
the carbon payback period is. And also it matters what fuel is being displaced. You, you, you don't want to displace you know, a very efficient electric heating uh, necessarily unless, uh, but you do want to displace oil, gas, uh, and propane. And that also impacts the carbon calculation. So um, conclusion, beware of studies about carbon impacts because a lot of them are about shipping pellets to Europe to make electricity. A lot of educated people think they know about uh, home heating because they've read these stories about uh, making electricity. So emissions, this is the Achilles heel of uh, wood burning. Now pellet stove emissions are very predictable, consistent uh, and modest. And the stoves work pretty much in homes as they worked in the lab. But the opposite is true with wood stove emissions. What the, 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 the emissions that were achieved in the lab are very rarely achieved by the homeowner. Um, a stove that hits 1.5 grams in the lab could easily be three to eight grams in the hands of the average homeowner. And it all depends on, a lot of it really depends on the moisture content of the wood. Now EPA emissions have gotten stricter over time and we just went through a, uh, a another NSPS, um, another set of regulations that drove emissions down to two grams an hour, something a lot of people thought could never be done. But uh, what we found is that in some ways, the, the labs are getting better at getting passing grades. Um, a lot of it has to do with how fast you can get the stove going. So if you know how to build a really clean fire that, that starts really well and burns really well, you can get passing numbers. Um, if, uh, if, you, you know, if you or I tried to burn that uh, stove in a lab, that stove would surely fail, even if we use the exact same wood that the lab technicians used. It's a real skill to burn uh, stoves well. And, and that's uh, become a, a big problem. So the future of regulations. So, Emissions can't go down and down with wood stoves. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that we want stoves to work well in the hands of consumers. And short of automating stoves, we need new test protocols so that designers of stoves are motivated to design how the homeowner is gonna use the stove. So you see in the bottom right, the two images on the right is how stoves have been uh, tested for the past 30, 40 years. And it's two by fours and four by fours, which of course homeowners don't use. So we will be seeing a transition to cordwood um, uh, to try to approximate uh, how stoves are actually used. And cordwood often needs a different, uh, you know, more or less, uh, um, oxygen in the as for primary and secondary fuel. Um, this is going to be a contentious uh, process. Um, the the photo on top shows Lisa Rector, who works at Nescom, uh, doing a presentation at one of our wood stove design challenges. Uh, that's uh, Rochelle Boyd from the EPA. Uh, looking at the screen there, she's one of the the NSPS drafters. And it's vital that, uh, you know, one of the, the biggest problems is making sure that our regulators understand this stuff because it is very complicated. And uh, it's good to see um, people like her uh, who are really now becoming experts in this. So, we would, we, you know, we are, we're, we consider ourselves an environmental group. We also consider ourselves a very pro wood heating group, but we think to expand wood heating in America, we really think it needs to be pellet heating. We, we don't think, we don't think there should be a lot more deployment of wood stoves in suburban neighborhoods. The, the neighborhood I live in, you know, we have too much wood smoke. Um, and it's a very liberal neighborhood, very educated people, but there are people that forget to order their wood early enough. Um, even when I tried, uh, you know, I heated my house with uh, wood for a long time and I 
too often looked up and I noticed smoke was coming from my chimney. <clears throat> and uh, it just too, it took me too much work, took too much time to keep that stove working well enough for me to feel good about it. Uh, and also for me to feel like I could be a good ambassador for uh, the technology in my neighborhood because everyone around here knows what I do. <laughs> so, so I switched to pellet to heating and uh, I'm very happy with pellet heating. I, I barely use any uh, gas from my gas furnace. Uh, I have a 2000 square foot home and it does 90% of the heating. And I just dump a bag in, hit a button and I uh, don't have to worry about it. So in places like Vermont, you can see on the right, you know, it's, uh, they now have 7% of their heat comes from pellets. It's pretty impressive, I think. Um, advanced wood heating systems means automated wood pellet boilers. <clears throat> bag pellets means it's a wood stove. When you have a wood stove, you'll put 40 pound bags in it, like I do. Now still 14%, 14 you know, the majority of people in Vermont still use cordwood. So what we would like to see uh, going forward is to increase the percentage of people using pellets and decrease the percentage using cordwood. <clears throat> and we think this is one of the, you know, an important piece of the residential renewable energy uh, pie because, uh, because <clears throat> solar and wind don't create heat very easily. So, you know, we've all watched what unfolded in Texas uh, over the past two weeks, but this is, happens at a, you know, not so dramatic level all over the country. You know, we, we need non-electric heat in America because we're not gonna have enough renewable electricity for our heating for 30, 40, 50 years. So both wood stoves and pellet stoves are extremely good for reducing fossil fuel usage, but pellet stoves do it really cleanly. Um, I have, uh, we recently put on solar panels. So now between uh, the solar panels and our pellet stove, our home uses extremely little fossil fuels. And we think that's a great model for homes all over the country. Um, air source heat pumps, you know, you can't create enough electricity with solar panels for an air source heat pump. Um, it's just, you'd have to have massive solar panels. But if you do have an air source heat pump that can provide a lot of your heat, and then you add like a pellet stove, that'll make sure your home is plenty warm at an affordable price, even in the, the uh, coldest parts of the winter. And we need, uh, you know, the peak loads, the, uh, you see in the lower right, the energy usage of homes is highest in the evening when everyone gets home from work or when we all used to get home from work uh, before we worked from home. And so this is a time when people use their stoves. So everyone that uses a wood or pellet stoves is doing a service to the grid by flattening that curve and uh, reducing the number of peak load events that happen during the winter in the evening. How am I doing on time? I think I'm doing okay, 7.53. So <clears throat> the smart home, yeah, we've heard so much about smart homes. Um, I think it is coming. And what we would love to see in smart homes is, and it's happening in Europe already, a home may have solar panels, may have heat pumps, may have a battery, may have solar thermal, and a computer can figure out which one of those things to use that's cheapest. So uh, in peak uh, electric times, so the, the, the electric rates may go up. You wanna make sure you're not using your heat pump then. It, it could automatically switch on a pellet stove or a pellet boiler. Um, if, uh, if it's gonna be cloudy for a couple days and you, you need to use your battery a lot, the system could automatically switch um, to whatever's cheapest uh, at the time. So we think the, that you know, pellet boilers, pellet stoves have a very uh, positive role to play in the larger mix. And once we get uh, computers that can help us figure out which 
source of energy to use at which time we will uh, be well on our way to having uh, you know, reducing carbon and getting more efficient heat. Okay, so now I'm at the end, I almost forgot. Uh, I was asked to talk about how to build a clean fire. So this is how you build a clean fire. You forget what you learned in the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. Put your biggest pieces of wood on the bottom of the stove. And then you put progressively smaller ones. And the reason this works, uh, and it's worked for centuries, people, uh, uh, especially in Europe, it was used and we kind of seem to have forgotten it over here. The thing is you don't want to burn your big pieces too soon or too quickly because they're cold. You want them to warm up uh, slowly and when they're warm, then they will combust more cleanly. Uh, so give this a try if you haven't tried it already. You'll find uh, that you can get your fire going much more successfully more often. And one of the keys is really just use a lot of kindling. Uh, fire starters are great too. Uh, a lot of kindling, fire starters, black and white uh, newspapers, not color. And um, this is uh, one of the best ways because the most smoke from a wood stove is often in the first half hour. So if you can reduce the emissions in the first half hour, you're doing a great service uh, to your neighborhood um, and you're getting more BTUs out of your wood by using a top-down fire. So that's it. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. And I assume this uh, presentation will be available to, to everyone afterwards. If it's not, I'm happy to send it out. Yes, that's correct. It'll, it'll be up on our website. Great, uh, thank you very much, John. And now it's uh, time for questions uh, for, for both Jay and John. And um, I noticed we've had quite a few coming through um, on the chat and there were some that were emailed in advance. So uh, I guess we'll turn it over to Chuck and Joe to uh, uh, bring those questions up. Let's okay. see, you're, you're, uh, there you go, Joe, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you both for your presentations. A uh, couple of questions to John. Um, the, question, the question is, I'm a new, newer homeowner in the state of Eastern Washington, and I wanna put a new wood stove into my home. Our winters are extremely cold and tend to lead to power outages frequently, uh, would you recommend a non-catalytic or a catalytic stove? And if you could please explain why so, so I can gain further knowledge on that. <laughs> so if you, uh, you know, we recommend um, catalytic stoves for people who are more tech, you know, who want to be a little more hands-on for, you know, energy nerds, uh, they, they, do, they do take a little more work, but they will be cleaner and more efficient. And especially if you want to use your stove 24 seven as a primary heater, uh, a catalytic stove can really be a benefit. Um, if you don't really care about uh, tending to the stove, a non-cat can be better. Uh, if you want to just kind of forget about it and not worry about the kind of annual upkeep and potentially you know, replacing the catalyst after uh, two or three years. Or I sorry, about <laughs> five or eight years. Catalysts these days should last five to eight years and sometimes more. Okay, thanks. And then one follow-up question, and you may have uh, touched on this with respect to tax credits, but uh, I'm also confused about the IRS tax credit. Where can I find more information about this? And I think one of your slides alluded to where to find that information. Yeah, so basically you want to uh, go to the EPA list and look at the efficiencies. Any stove you see on that list that's over 75%, you're assured of getting that 26% tax credit. Uh, however, you know, the homeowner, you, until the IRS makes that issues guidance, you could uh, rely on the manufacturer and you will not be penalized. So it's only after the IRS issues guidance, and that could happen you know, in the next few months. At that point, you really need to pay attention to what the uh, EPA list says. 
And of course, the, the tax credit, you know, you have to pay the full price up front and then next April, you get to take 26% of the purchase price and the installation. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. It's not just 26% of the purchase price, but it's the insulation, it's the chimney, it's the, the uh, floor protection. So it's a great deal. And we hope this will lead to more people getting professional installation because that's another key part of having a clean burning stove is making sure that it's installed right and, and installed safely. John, is that subject to any limitations on the amount that you can get back in, in terms of uh, annual limits or lifetime limits or anything like that? No, nope, there are no limitations. Um, so, you know, we think that it could lead to people buying more expensive stoves. And I think the more expensive the stove is, the more um, people will really want that tax credit. So the stoves that you get at Home Depot and uh, Lowe's, those cheaper stoves, they're not going to meet 75% anyway. But you know that people don't won't really care about the tax credit necessarily on those stoves. But if you're spending five thousand bucks on a really good pellet stove or a really good catalytic wood stove, and then another thousand to have it installed, that's where the tax credit is really going to help you. And that's why manufacturers who make those stoves. Are, uh, are really happy to, to see this tax credit. Okay, so Jay, the next question is for you, I think. Where's all that ash being dumped? And I'll follow up with a, with, a, with a caveat. Is there a use for it? Is there a secondary use that the ash goes towards to have a second life? Uh, Jay, you're, um, you're muted. Yeah, I know. Okay, thank you. I think, I think it was my daughter making too much noise earlier <laughs> that caused that. But yes, ash is a valuable um, commodity. Um, there's a market for it. The ash that we're, the really fine ashes that we're getting are great as far as um, the farmers are concerned because they spread it on their fields to, um, you know, tune the chemical aspects of the of the of the ground that they're planting on so there is but in too many cases people just don't think about that and they pay to get it hauled off to the dump and they're paying to do it so yeah and i'm talking about large systems again i'm not talking about you know the home systems because that's easily the more input as far as fuel is concerned, the more output as far as ash is concerned. So our systems produce a lot of ash because of the amount of fuel we're putting into the system. Um, the, the home systems are not the same. And I, I think John might have some input as far as what they do with the ash out of their systems. I'd spread it in my backyard if I had the choice. I talk to an engineer and talk about the circular economy and second use for that ash and actually get some money for it. Yeah. They, they also use it in asphalt. John, do you have something to add? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there are lots of things to use it for. I, I recently <clears throat> put it on my sidewalk when uh, we had an ice storm, but I regretted that because I found that I tracked it into the house. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But using it on your garden periodically, you know, you don't want to put too much though with the, uh, but yeah, using the garden. But otherwise, you know, we just throw it out in the back um, and uh, it's, uh, it's good for the plants and we don't want to, we don't want to send it to the, and put anything more in the landfill. Joe, you have the next question? Sure. I think this question's for Jay. Uh, does all that stored biomass begin to get very hot? and cause metal expansion and other related problems? Yeah, I'm not really sure I understand that question. You're talking about storing it in the storage compartment? Or I'm assuming so. Okay. Well, it's possible, but the more we cut down the oxygen that also goes into that area, the less we're going to see that sort of thing. The only time we've really seen fires is when people store dry wood in a building, it it uh, has a leak in the in the in the ceiling, 
and it gets wet again and then it dries off. And that's where spontaneous combustion could be a problem. But I've seen that twice in over four, almost 40 years worth of business we've been in. Well, the next question is, what is the life cycle analysis of burning wood pellets versus cord wood? And I think what the question is focused on is all the upfront processing to uh, produce the pellets. How does that affect the life cycle analysis? Yeah, you want to take that one, John? <laughs> sure. <laughs> So you can't beat cordwood, you know, local cordwood, a tree that uh, comes down within five miles of your house or something, you just have a chainsaw, maybe a pickup truck. Uh, pellets do have a little more fossil fuel input into the process, but you know, um, it's far less than the input that it takes to drill and uh, transport and, uh, you know, what have you with fossil fuels. So we still think it's, it's very modest for pellets. For pellets. Uh, compared to gas or oil or propane. Um, yeah. yeah. And the, the efficiency difference between burning the two is tremendous. It's like John said, the smarter the particle, the more you can get the air to it and the turbulence to it, the more efficient you are. So the efficiency is a big gain there. Yeah. And a lot of it depends on how you dry your the, the, one of the biggest uh, fossil fuel uses in making pellets is drying your fuel. Um, and you can dry that fuel with, with uh, wood chips or pellets. Um, so if you do that, then you're, you cut down on your fossil fuel inputs a lot. Uh, but I think overall, it, it may be of the energy of a pellet, it may only be five or 10% um, of that energy is taken to produce the pellet. Uh, transporting the pellets is also an issue. You know, once you put it on a train or a boat, actually it's, uh, it's, it doesn't take much energy to transport uh, pellets. Uh, truck is more. Um, so that's why, you know, you, you, you often find a lot of pellets that are produced locally within, you know, 50, 100 miles. Thank you. Joe, got the next one? First, speaking of locally here in Pennsylvania, we have a tree of heaven problem that's associated with the invasive spotted lantern fly uh, species. Uh, do you have any input regarding its use, the tree of heaven, in central home wood furnaces? I'm assuming a BTU value or anything like that. Oh, sorry, I don't. Jay, do you know about that? No, there's, there's no BTU difference. I mean, that's a real, real good option for buying fuel and either converting it into pellets to burn in a home system or as far as our bigger systems are concerned. Let's get it out of the woods and, and uh, there's no detrimental value in doing that. You know, one funny thing, with a wood stove, you always want a hardwood, you don't want a softwood if you have the choice. But it's the opposite with the pellet stove. With pellet stoves, you want softwood because once you compress wood, it has the same density and pellets also have um, some, uh, um, was it not, uh, well, anyway, you, pellet stones will give you, uh, made pellets made of softwood will give you like 10 or 20% more BTUs than hardwood. That's interesting. Um, I have a question here uh, that relates to person trying to make decision. So I'm going to read it verbatim. We're doing a historic renovation. Architect wants to put back a wood burning fireplace, likely in addition to air source heat pump as primary heat. What should we be thinking about? All options are on the table. Fireplace, stove, nothing at all, etc. <laughs> Well, you're asking a person that's not ex exactly objective. I would say put a pellet stove in the fireplace, either pellet stove insert, or you can just put a pellet stove in front of your fireplace. That's what I've always done. I always like having a, a stove, whether it's a wood stove or a pellet stove with air being able to naturally circulate around it, uh, which you don't have with the insert. But that'll give you the option to, uh, if you put a wood stove in, it gives you the make sure you have uh, heat if the power goes out because heat pumps need power. 
Pellet stoves also need power, which is one of the big reasons people don't like them. Um, in the future, once uh, homes have more batteries uh, in them, uh, that won't be as much of a concern. So if, if you, once you do have a home battery, that pellet stove will, could be uh, fine during a power outage. But I would, uh, you know, we have a bias against an open fireplace just because uh, there's real no heat benefit and they are much more polluting. So we always recommend uh, using fireplaces for um, a wood or a pellet stove. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a that's a net heat loss to just rely on a fireplace. And since you mentioned power interruptions, uh, we have a question that's what power requirements do pellet stoves have and are they operational during a power outage? Yeah, no, that's that's their weakness. They only cost about five or ten dollars a month to run. They have an auger and they have fans. Um, uh, and there are some you, know, you can get a battery backup, but sometimes the batteries only work, you know, for three, five, seven hours. Um, so, uh, you know, there's still not a great, um, they're not great options, uh, unless you have a home generator. Uh, that's probably the best thing if, you know, you can get a home generator for $500,000 and that'll keep your pellet stove and other stuff in your house running during a power outage. Yeah, you meant 500 to 1,000. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so this one's, I think, for Jay. Uh, it could be for both of you, but is there a large enough industry? Um, is, is there a large enough pellet-making industry to fuel millions of homes in the winter? No doubt about it. I mean, we have it now. Um, there's, there's, you know, pellet producers in down south that have gone out of business because the heating season's been too low, but we have plenty of sources for producing wood pellets, both softwood and hardwood or the combination of the two. Okay. Joe, you got the next one? Joe. I don't hear him. He's muted. Uh, oh, you gotta love, you gotta love it. Um, can you speak to creosote formation and avoidance? Sure, well, really everything I've been talking about, burning a clean fire means less creosote. So creosote is the main reason you get creosote is because your wood is wet and you're not giving your, your stove enough air. Um, you virtually, some pellet stoves will never get any creosote. It's possible to get creosote with the pellet stove, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's negligible compared to wood stoves. So that's why you wanna use dry wood, you know, give your stove enough air, make sure the stove is installed professionally uh, and have it inspected. And if you burn dry wood, uh, you'll have uh, chimney sweeps tell you, you know, that you barely need a, it swept for maybe two or three years. But uh, if you burning, it also depends how much you burn. Some uh, houses up north, they'll burn five or 10 cords even. So if you're not burning the right wood, you need to sweep your chimney twice a year uh, to avoid you know, a, a, a chimney fire. And, and that's something to really take uh, very seriously. You don't want a chimney fire. <laughs> okay, we have Attila Kivey. T-U-L-I-K-I-V-I -I. for the past three years. Are there users groups for this brand? And can I file an amended return for 2018 when I bought it? It was okay. quite expensive. Yeah, the Tula Kiwi, uh, there is uh, on Facebook, there's definitely masonry heater Facebook groups. Um, so as long as you're on Facebook, you can find them. Uh, they're, they're quite lively and informative. You can ask questions. You have a lot of masonry heater nerds there who are happy to answer questions. There's also a site called hearth.com, which I recommend. It's a lot of the uh, experts hang out there and they're happy to answer questions. So I always uh, direct people to go there as well. Uh, in terms of the 26% the tax credit only works for systems installed as of this year. 
if you bought a system last year, you can get the $300 credit. Um, so I'm not sure you may be able to uh, amend your return from 2018, but you'd still only get $300 credit. <clears throat> Is an automated stove easier to use than a cat or an on-cat stove? Yeah, you know, there are not many on the market yet, but they they will, they are easier because they adjust the air for you. They can even um, talk to you basically. They can send a text message to your phone and say, hey, it's time to reload. Or, um, you know, I'm over firing, whatever. Uh, there's a lot of potential for the stove to help you burn better by interacting with the user. Um, but the idea is you could put a, a, a log in there, put your wood in, walk away, and be assured that that stove is going to operate uh, as well as it can with the wood that you put in it until you need to reload it. So, And it, they also could be catalytic. They could be catalytic or non-catalytic. So the next question is exactly that. Can a person find maintenance instructions on a catalytic wood stove? Yeah, one of the great thing about the internet is pretty much every uh, brand has their, their manual on the website of the manufacturer that, that uh, sells it. So they're quite easy to find. Every once in a while, it might be hard to find one if, it, if the stove went out of production you know, 20 or 30 years ago. But, uh, but yeah, they're easy to find and they're, they're actually really useful. A lot of people don't read them, but, um, but there's good info in those uh, instructions. And I, uh, this question, John, and I'm sorry if you already answered this, uh, is your home heated with a pellet stove or a pellet fired boiler? So down here in Maryland, uh, a pellet boiler is almost a, uh, overkill. Um, so it's a stove. And I, my house is modest. It's a 2,000 square foot house. And we, uh, the pellet stove is, heats the core area. We close our bedrooms off during the day. So they actually can stay a little cold and we don't mind them a little chilly at night. Um, but the, but the, we have a Harman stove. It's, it's one of the best uh, pellet stoves in the market. But uh, most Decent sized pellet stoves can heat a uh, average size home uh, for you know ninety percent of the heating needs. Is uh, of course it's like any heating system. It depends if your house is really leaky or well insulated. Um, so all, all those same factors apply. So we always encourage people you know before you install a stove, get an energy audit, uh, do some basic weatherizing. Uh, and then you may not even need quite a big a stove as you would have if you left your house totally leaky. Okay. Uh, this question might be a little bit confrontational, but I'm going to read it verbatim. In a global economy that is more and more conscious of carbon emissions and impacts to climate and air quality, how can we be encouraging burning biomass into the future other than as a stopgap between renewable energy technologies? How can anything other than a small percentage of folks burning locally harvest wood be called sustainable? And I think you may have addressed some of that in your yeah. presentation. Jay, well, you, know, you, you do that first, then I'll follow up. Okay, I mean, okay. For one thing, it's renewable. If we don't cut down or clear cut or get rid of some of the scraggly trees in our woods, then they're gonna die someday. So we're doing mother nature, a, you know, uh, a good deed by cutting them down, grinding them up and burn them because we're controlling the emissions a lot more than we would be if those trees just died in the woods. So um, that's, I mean, burning biomass is carbon neutral. So I have a slightly different take on that. I think, I mean, it's a good question. I think uh, combustion technologies, including wood and pellet uh, heating are not ideal. And uh, 30, 40 years from now, if, if we have an abundance of electricity from wind and solar, uh, I think that 
that probably will win out. Of course, it has to be affordable enough. Um, and so I don't necessarily see, uh, especially cordwood burning, I don't consider sustainable if it's too polluting because we have to consider not just the carbon, but we have to consider air quality. So um, like we say, we're, we're not, uh, uh, we don't wanna see the number of wood stoves grow too quickly in America uh, under current conditions. Uh, there's some countries like in, in the United Kingdom, there's a law that says, it's just kicking in now, you're not allowed to sell unseasoned wood. Um, now in countries like that, that's gonna transform wood heating into a much cleaner uh, endeavor than it is in this country. Um, so it's a good question. You know, I, think, uh, I think pellet systems will be very uh, uh, sustainable for you know, five to 10% of a population. There is a limit you know, because you don't, for, even for pellet uh, manufacturers, you don't have unlimited source of cheap residuals. Um, the cheapest residual is sawdust. A lot of pellet uh, manufacturers, they're attached to the back end of a uh, wood mill, uh, of a sawmill. And so they have a, a plentiful supply of, of cheap, dry sawdust. But if you have to go out and cut down trees, that's expensive. Um, and, uh, and that would drive up the price of pellets. Uh, currently, you know, with these rock bottom fossil fuel prices, it's hard enough for uh, pellets to compete. Um, so you, you're not really saving money right now if you heat with gas, but you still save a lot of money if you're heating with uh, oil or propane. But um, like we, we think uh, that uh, you know, wood combustion uh, is an important part of the mix. It, needs, it should and is getting cleaner, uh, both you know, at the scale that Jay was talking about with ESPs. Uh, the residential scale, it's always also getting cleaner. Um, so we think it has a good uh, lifespan in our energy mix, but I, I, I suspect it will decline uh, over coming decades. So I, I just want to say, I posed the question, this my name is Jason, um, and I really appreciate the tactful and thought, you know, the thought that went into the responses. I, I would say just for the group and for the benefit of, um, for Jay, I, I'm pretty sure that at utility scale, there's, it's not carbon neutral. At residential, yes, I think it could be argued um, that it's carbon neutral, but at utility scale, I, I would venture to guess that that's not the case. Yeah, I agree with that, <laughs> Jason, but I'm hanging oh. on to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Well, well not, nothing is completely carbon neutral, even uh, wind and well, solar. I yeah, I know. <laughs> And you have geothermal, you know, the old geothermal pumps were very inefficient. So you're using uh, electricity off the grid to get your renewable uh, right. out of the ground. So, you know, every, every renewable has, uh, you know, it's upsides and downsides. It's amazing the amount of opposition you have to offshore wind. Um, you have a lot of opposition to using agricultural fields for solar. Um, so, so much of this has to do with where you place it um, and, and how you run it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's all... It's an interesting yeah. question here about the absence of, is there any thought about tree planting specifically to provide the feedstock for fire burning and biomass burning? Is there a particular replacement or a particular kind of tree planting? Would we, don't, we don't cut do down you, trees. You don't cut down trees okay. up here. I mean, except for dead trees, typically in the Northeast, and they need to be cut down for firewood. But my customers don't cut down trees. It's typically uh, a, a product that they produce by sawmills, furniture plants, uh, cabinet manufacturers. It's a, it's a wood what we used to call a wood waste. And my gosh, we don't use that term anymore. We use wood bag, wood residue, and now we use biomass. So we don't cut ground trees specifically for burning them. And I don't know many people that do. Okay. So the, the other 
question, there's about three questions around this, and that's the hazards of uh, pulmonary health concerns around the emissions from wood burning and the impacts of wood smoke. Well, in my case, we don't have wood smoke. The state government or the federal EPA doesn't accept wood smoke, so that's why we have emission control equipment that we have today. And they're even looking at condensables anymore. The really, really small stuff that we never worried about in the past. So um, I'm sure we're polluting the atmosphere to a certain extent, but we're, we're reducing the particulate, which is what we're talking about here, to the, to the <clears throat> best degree that we can. Are there any additives that are of concern to the pellets themselves? No, pellets, uh, it's pretty cool. When you compress a pellet you uh, and heat it up, the lignin in the wood acts as a binder. So it comes out um, shiny and hard. Uh, the only additive you'll find, you'll find a teeny bit of vegetable oil that's used uh, uh, just because it's part of the gears, uh, Jay, you know more about this than I do, but when you, uh, you have to have a little oil in your system, but that's uh, very negligible. The, the only problem that's come up, uh, it, it could be if you use pallets, uh, it could be wood. You, you definitely don't wanna use any treated lumber in your uh, pellet supply. So that's why PFI uh, certifies pellets because you need to ensure that pellet producers are using raw you know, um, wood products. Uh, you don't want to use uh, demolition, you know, construction debris, for instance. Um, that's uh, bad for the air and it also be really bad for your stove. Well, thank you very much. Phil, do you have any final remarks here? We're coming up on 8.30. No, I, I don't. Um, I, there were some email questions that I'm not- uh, I think we covered those, didn't we? Okay, I wasn't privileged to them, so. Uh, Joe oh, I and I get copies of those, and I think he asked those. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I saw, um, I could see, I saw a chat, something came in from Rochelle Boyd. Uh, she's with the EPA. I didn't see the question, but if the moderator could find that question, I'd love to see if I could answer it. Rochelle Boyd? Yeah. Here she is. For John, is the tax credit a refundable or non-refundable credit? Also, is your home heated with a pellet stove or a pellet-fired boiler? Yeah, my uh, yeah, my home is heated with a, a stove. Um, now, it's a it's not so. If you don't owe any tax, you won't benefit from the tax credit. So that's that's actually important. It's a good question, Rochelle. It's important for people to know that. Uh, if you're planning on buying an expensive stove, you may be able to have less money withheld from your paycheck, for instance, to make sure that you at least have that amount of money that you would otherwise owe the government because they're not gonna send you a check back. They will cancel that amount of money <laughs> as a tax credit, but they're not gonna send you a check for that money. So uh, manage your finance as well. <clears throat> Well, thank you both, John and Jay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in our monthly meeting and sharing your expertise and how to make a better fire. Phil, do you have any final comments here? Uh, just a reminder to stay tuned, uh, book discussion on March 11th and uh, our next presentation on greening hydrogen uh, at the uh, March 30th, and then uh, solar storage uh, at the end of April. Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks everyone for attending. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Have a good you. night. Thanks.